I really want to make sure you guys get this information. And if you aren't able to join us, that you get it afterwards. So that's great. So I'm always so pleased and humbled um, to co-host dynamic programming with the Institute in Aging and partner with Catlin Morgan as education manager there. The Institute on Aging is an amazing resource um, serving diverse populations of older adults and disabled adults through innovative programs which promote maintenance of health, well-being, independence, and participation in the community. They serve Greater San Francisco and the San Bernardino communities. Um, one of the other great benefits of partnering with the Institute on Aging, besides the professionalism and their services offered, is that they offer CEUs. So following this session, Catlin will be sending out an email uh, with an evaluation form. If you want CEUs, please fill that out. If you don't get CEUs, we would love your feedback and support uh, and hear how this was for you. Um, participants will also receive the slide deck and other resources and materials that we have so much of. I'm trying to hone in on what should we, start, we, we should provide with you afterwards because there's so much detail of, of good stuff and I don't want to overwhelm all of you. Um, this particular session, Behind the Red Tape, Disposition, Ceremony, and Legacy, is also part of the Reimagine Life, Loss, and Love Worldwide Virtual Festival that actually has been extended through September 1st. I would like to invite our colleague, Catlin Morgan, you, some of you already heard her great singing voice earlier, but I'd like her to read the Reimagine Festival intention. Um, so as you know, she has, I, one of the other love, things I love about Catlin, it just, in, in, on top of all how organized and um, efficient she is, is her, her sweet voice. So, Catelyn, uh, I ask you to read the intention for us. Sure, I'd be happy to. So this intention, there is no life without death, no love without loss. They are in constant complementary motion. But never before in our lives has the world stood st so still. In the face of distance, illness, and isolation, we are here, together, reimagining a changed world, kinder, slower, more just. We are reimagining the giving and receiving of love, the cycles of loss and new beginnings, and what it means to be fully alive. We are here. Thanks, Catelyn. I really do like that. It just sets such a powerful um, tone and, and kind of grounds us all. Once again, I'm Stephanie Elkins, Continuum of Care Coach and Consultant with Be Present Care. And in the opening session uh, description, we, we posed the question, how do you best care for death? The answer was, it depends. If you're a planner by nature or, or, or uh, out of personal professional necessity, it is essential to have the language, the resources, and the ability to reflect on the personal, cultural, and values of which are, are all vital components for the end of life prep preparation. Just to do a quick overview of what we're gonna be doing today is um, have a couple uh, polling questions to kind of get to know you a little bit. Uh, and so we'll do that in a moment. And then we're gonna get to know the panelists. They're gonna go around and do a quick brief introduction, self-introduction of themselves. And then we're gonna go back around and we'll go more into detail of different planning options, starting with Rebecca, the legal considerations, estate planning considerations, the dying process and ceremony with uh, Jill, disposition and burial with Sean, um, and a personal reflection of looking at how those all plans can fall into place uh, um, as somebody is a caregiver for their, um, Megan's gonna share her story, her, her, her father's story, Bob, which is her dad's story, but also hers as well. Um, then we're gonna have some opportunity for a Q and A. Uh, so we'll have some really good time to go around and just have the opportunity for you to ask some of the questions or provide comments. We will be opening up for questions like uh, Megan mentioned. We will be looking in the chat box and offer asking some of those questions as well. And then we're gonna go back into what does legacy mean to you? Uh, so that's some of the stuff that we'll just kind of be going through, but I know Q&A with a lot of the information that you'll receive from our panelists will be really great. 
Steph, you said that these slides themselves will be shared with all the guests. Is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, so this is our, our, our presentation, our, our uh, speakers. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you a couple polling questions. I'm launching poll. Ooh. So um, basically, this is a time thing where you guys uh, can, if you fill in there, what your feel, what um, what field you work in. Ooh. So Steph, I'm not sure how to vote. Oh, oh, I see. Got it. Okay. No. So I'm seeing that some people are working on it. It's coming up um, of some people. Does everybody see the polling? I see it. Yes, I don't Julie, thank you for the heads up. I got, I got the thumbs up from Julie. That was great. Thank you. So yes, people are starting to um, participate. Oh, the submit button doesn't work. Hmm. Well, I yeah, see some people are able to do it. Oh. Great, I'm gonna give us about 30 more seconds or so. And there's actually two questions. So the first question you see is what field specialty are you in? And the second question is what interest, what it's, what interest, uh, interest are you enjoying today's session? And we got it all over the back and I'm gonna show you, share with you with a poll in a moment. You have to scroll down to submit. Thank you, you guys are all so helpful. I think we're all helpers and supporters here, so thank you. That's why I love the chat box. All right, I'm about 10 more seconds and then we'll kind of, I'll share, you know, who, who's with us today. All right. So the poll is closed. We got a lot of people out of the um, spread across the arena of specialties. Are you able to see the poll right now? So we have about, most people we have, we have across the board here with advocacy, care management, NLF, doula, midwifery, um, estate planning, healthcare, uh, medical care, human social services, and wellness. And everybody's kind of life work. I love that everybody, the life death planning, that's all of our work here together. So thank you for answering that. Um, I see that there's a lot, a lot of interest in the death planning and process and ceremony and memorials along with everything else. So I'm really happy to see that uh, across the board. There are zero funeral professionals in this room. Yeah. Right. Um, right, because, yes, oh, oh, Sean's raising her head. She's like, what about me? Well, oh of God. course, you, Sean, you know, but doesn't that shock you a little bit? Um, no, because the audience that 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 um, Catlin has is mostly people on the front end of right. advanced it's, it's, planning, and right. that's why it was so important, because Catlin does... With the planning there, there's a lot on the front end about advanced care planning. I've loved a lot of those workshops. In the end, a lot of the conversations that we've had about end-of-life options, medical aid and dying, how, um, caring in the home, but the death planning conversation, and I think that's why Cat, uh, Catlin was so important, is that this, this group really needed more of that information. And I think you're right. In the other end, Jill, I think there are a lot of people in the funeral space that maybe talk about advanced care planning, but it's really kind of marketed and shared just around funerals, and we want to take that out of there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a kind of a, a way of looking at it. Okay. So now we're going to go around and we are going to um, share our speakers, the A team that we have with us today. I'm going to go back on there. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca if she wants to go ahead and introduce herself. And one of the reasons why I, I um, that with this team, and I want you to consider this all for yourself, is that everybody should have their A team that they work with in terms of diversity. And I asked all these, all my colleagues here is, 
um, why do you think I invited you to be part of this panel? So they're going to kind of share a little bit of them, but with the context of why did Stephanie invite you to be part of this? So go ahead. I'm going to uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rebecca Goldfarb. I'm an estate planning and elder law attorney. I've known Stephanie for a long time. And so thank you so much for including me in your A-team. I'm excited. Uh, my background, uh, and then I'll get to why I think Stephanie included me, my background is I was the only grandchild in my family. So I've cared for seven family members, not including my parents yet, thank God. Uh, they don't need me yet. Uh, and so it got me into that caregiving role and, and then knowing that I wanted to go to law school, estate planning and elder law enables us to really build deep relationships and very intimate relationships with our clients and also have lifelong relationships with them um, and really focus on some difficult subject matter to help explain and educate and empower and guide them. So, um, so in terms of the, um, the purpose of, of what we do or the why of what we do, it's to get to know people's wishes to make sure they avoid court and to maintain family harmony for those families who have harmony. Sometimes it's too difficult uh, and, and we can't do that. Um, and we're planning for incapacity equal to death um, since you know dementia and all these other things cause people to, to become incapacitated. We have to equally plan for that. Most estate plans kind of ignore the incapacity side, unfortunately. And we do this through a very comprehensive estate plan. So I'm gonna talk more when, when my time is to talk about estate planning. But I think that the reason um, Stephanie included me is because we're really outside of the box estate planner and elder law attorneys. And so we're looking at this holistically and, com and comprehensively, um, and we're treating all of our clients like family. So, you know, I'm guiding them just the same as, as I would if they were, you know, my pretend sisters and brothers, since I don't have siblings. Um, so I think that, that being that comprehensive and, and being that intimate is, is what Stephanie is what kind of bonded us uh, way back at Lisa's place. So thank you. Wait, you're muted, Stephanie. I pass it on to Jill. Jill, go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, well, thank you. Um, my name is Jill Shock, and um, my my journey into death care started um, with a big fracture in my life where death uh, came to me as a surprise. And it was something that I had to piece together all on my own for the first time. And I ended up asking myself the question, you know, who, it, who can help us? Um, so my schooling, I went back to do medical ethics and I ended up um, becoming a clinical chaplain. And I did that for almost a decade. Um, while I was doing that, I stepped out of um, working within healthcare and started a business called Death Doula LA. It's a small business. I run it myself. Um, but what, what I do as a doula, um, and you might have heard that word in the birth context, but in general, what the word doula means, it's a Greek word, it means some a woman in service. Um, so what I do as a doula, I think the best, best way to explain it, um, if death and dying were a city, um, I would be your best tour guide. Wherever you wanna go, whatever experience you wanna have, I'll take you down the roads and tell you where to park your car and like um, let you know exactly how to get there. And so I think Stephanie had me speak on this panel because, you know, like Rebecca and her firm, I look at the dying person and their loved ones as a whole. And what we do is we stop and we take the time to piece together not only the pre-planning pre part of their life, 
Um, but we also look at the ceremony around death experience. Um, and today I'll be walking you guys through a bit of a imaginative experience, um, just so that you can get a taste of what's possible for you around end of life. So thank you for having me, Stephanie. Pleasure. All right, Sean. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Stephanie, for having me with this wonderful group of people. Um, very talented group of people. Um, when I was asked why I think Stephanie brought me aboard, I would have to say it's because I bring many years of hands-on experience in the funeral industry as I've been in it since 2006. Um, I also have worked in high volume um, funeral homes and crematory, so I understand a wide variety of needs um, when it comes to funeral arranging having experienced so many different types of services over the years. Um, I too had started my own business um, because I was looking to add to the funeral experience by bringing in before death care as well. Um, but I, I'm gonna just stick to the disposition side of things when I talk later, like, a little bit later. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks again for having me. Right. All right, Megan, you're going to have to stop for your moderating chat. Well, I will for a second and, and, and share your, your story. Why did I invite you to participate? I'll take that assistant hat off. Um, so Stephanie and I have worked together on a number of projects and we are part of a collective along with Jill Shock um, based here in Southern California called the Dive Into Death Collective. So I, I considered myself sort of a death care generalist. Um, I entered the business in 2017 when my mom died while I was on maternity leave with my second child. Um, and I made a plan when I went back to my corporate banking job um, that I was going to integrate some of the learnings that I, I had taken from that personal experience. Um, and instead what happened is I realized that I didn't want to work at that corporate banking job at all. Um, and so I sort of jumped with two feet and I've, I've been involved in a number of different um, projects. And I think rather than getting into any of those details, the, the reason that Stephanie asked me to join today is because I sort of represent an interesting hybrid where um, I was a professional in the death care space when um, just about two and a half years after my mom died, my dad was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And so that's really the story that I'm here to talk about today is what does it look like when you've done, when you've devoted years of your life to thinking and talking about these things, how does that play out? Um, and actually, um, Jill was the death doula for my family. She was a friend and a colleague prior to uh, stepping into that professional role. So being able to share and speak from that position is um, something I'm really looking forward to today and, and sharing that case study um, as we sort of uh, framed it. Terrific. All right, so now you've got a sense of who we're going to be spending a little more time with. Uh, so thank you. Once again, you can add, we will have an opportunity for Q&A after each individual on the panel speaks. So we'll get back to that in a second. Um, right now, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Rebecca to talk about estate planning. You're on mute, Rebecca. So just let me get it. Let me unmute Rebecca. Oh, you got, got it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm the worst when it comes to this technology. So you're not alone. Uh, I <laughs> I could talk about estate planning and elder law forever, um, but I'm gonna. So I'm looking at the time to kind of keep track. Uh, so so estate planning, I think, is a terrible word for what we do because a lot of people come to us and say, "I don't have an estate to plan for, so I don't need to do anything." I have yet, after almost 12 years of doing this, come up with a better uh, term for it. So I will just explain it in the most basic ways. Um, for those of you who have these documents already, you may already know this. For those of you who don't, um, then this is, you know, an opportunity to learn. It's also really important uh, that you reach out to your clients and your colleagues and patients if you're, you know, in the medical community so that you can educate them because 
my goal is to have people avoid wasting money and time and energy and heartache in court. And the only way we can do that is with the proper planning. So having said that, um, we have four main documents in an estate plan and they all work together in different ways. So they're all equally important. So on the, um, if you look at that, uh, I'm so used to like using my hands and pointing and, but <laughs> if you look at uh, the slide, you'll see it has four quadrants. So the, um, the healthcare directive is obviously, all of us are familiar with that. It has two components. It gives the legal authority to someone to make medical decisions for you. And it also says what your wishes are. So in other states, it's the power of attorney with the living will part. I think it got confusing for in California. You know, we like to be different anyway, but, um, but it's because we have a living will, we have a will, we have a living trust. So now we just call both of those parts together, the advanced directive, the power of attorney and the living will, the wishes part. So this document is, is sorely neglected um, in general in our community. Uh, but it's really neglected within the estate planning attorney world. And that's unfortunate because I think this is the most important document in the entire plan. It is when you are incapacitated and you cannot speak for yourself and you are asking someone to stand in your shoes and make serious decisions. So this, this should be filled out by every single person once they turn 18. Remember that once you turn 18, your parent can't do it for you. People have this myth that, oh, well, my spouse will figure it out. Well, your spouse doesn't have legal authority without this document. You can't do it for an aging parent. So I cannot emphasize enough how important this document is. There are, there are you know, free ways to do it, and then there are more detailed ways to do it. Um, I'm always happy to answer those questions, but I, only, I know I only have 10 minutes. So, um, so the advanced directive is really important. It also has to include the HIPAA waiver. The HIPAA is the federal and California and each state has their own um, state version of the Privacy Act between the medical community um, and you as the patient. And so if your advanced directive does not include the HIPAA waiver, it theoretically won't work. Now there are plenty of people in, in the medical uh, profession who will violate HIPAA, but you don't want to plan for that by not having a HIPAA waiver. So HIPAA came into law in 2004. Any advanced directive before that will not have a HIPAA waiver. So that essentially means that you have the legal authority to make decisions for someone, but the medical community can't tell you anything. So I don't know who could ever make decisions in that way. Um, certainly not wisely. Uh, and we've seen advanced directives even into 2016 that don't have HIPAA waivers. So it's really important to have a HIPAA waiver. Um, the other component of this area is a PULST, which is the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It has essentially replaced the DNR, the Do Not Resuscitate. It is messed up. I was going to swear because I'm a big swearer. It is messed up all the time. I was just talking to a client yesterday who is like in her late 60s. She has no health issues. And her doctor said, you have to fill this out. And by the way, it expires every five years. I don't know where these things are coming from, that it expires and that when you are healthy and not at the end of your life, you have to fill one out. But, um, but there's mistakes all the time in, in this document. But it is really important to, when you want a DNR, do not resuscitate. It's the way your wishes will most likely be honored. Um, so that's the healthcare directive. The power of attorney is equally as important, um, not about your medical decisions, but about every other decision. Who pays your bills? Who can file taxes? Who can deal with a credit card over the phone? Who can deal with a legal document that needs to be signed? This person handles everything other than health decisions. So again, once you're over 18, no one can do this for you. If you do not have these two documents, the, health, the advanced directive and the power of attorney and you're over 18 and you lose mental capacity, you will head to conservatorship. Conservatorship starts at about $10,000 and it's about $5,000 for the rest of your life every year. So it is super expensive and you want to avoid it. This is where a judge is going to tell you 
who makes your medical decisions and who makes your other legal and financial decisions. So I can't emphasize enough, which is why I repeat it, get your advanced directive done, get your power of attorney done, do not burden your family with conservatorship, it's not fair. Um, so the trust and the will uh, basically both say who gets your stuff when you die. But in California, and I know we have some people who are not from California on the, on the webinar today, um, in California, we're very trust-based because all wills go through probate. Let me say that again. People don't know this. All wills go through probate if you have over $166,250 that do not have beneficiary designations or you co-own with someone else. So in California, we're very trust-based because you, if you could guess, California has a really expensive probate. So if you end up going through probate because you have a house, because you have some assets, whatever, um, it takes uh, the, the probate process is, will cost about 4% of your estate. You do not get to subtract your mortgage. So you could have a $500,000 house with a $450,000 mortgage. The probate fees are calculated on the $500,000 house. So they're astronomical. It is 100% avoidable with a trust that's written well and done well um, and funded well, meaning we retitle the assets into the trust. So if you've done your trust, um, but you haven't retitled your assets into it, then your trust has no jurisdiction over everything and we end up in court anyway. So essentially, once you get a trust, you get what's called a pour over will. It's a safety net to your trust, but the trust is what governs everything. So on the left side, if you become, once you turn 18, you need your health directive and your power of attorney, you may not have any assets, so that's all you need. But then once you get some assets, and especially if you have kids, we wanna control from the grave with these kids until they're a little bit older, um, then you, you need a trust. If you don't and you end up in probate, your kids are getting everything out right at 18. You know any 18 year olds who can handle $5,000, let alone 100,000 or more? Um, it, it's a nightmare waiting to happen. So the comprehensive plan is all of those documents together. Um, and essentially elder law is when the role reversal happens and we start needing to care for our elders. Um, and there's a whole host of um, resources and help that elder law attorneys provide to help you navigate through that, that process. A lot of it's therapy, I will admit. Um, so sometimes I just say like I'm a super expensive therapist on, on the elder law side, but it helps save court fees and that's more expensive. So it's, it's important to, to find a good elder law attorney uh, to be a part of your A-team because when, when we're good, we're, we're really good uh, for families. So that's pretty much the estate planning 101 and um, I'm always happy to answer questions here and, and offline, you know, email, call, whatever. I, I really want to help people uh, with, with our knowledge. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, you know, part of my work and where I feel uh, based on what you were sharing is around advanced healthcare directives and, pro and um, decision making and so on. That's kind of the sweet spot where I really feel to be in partnership with you and the healthcare systems to ensure that people are having the right conversations. Uh, and that the documents don't live in a drawer, uh, but are out in the, uh, you know, out for the, your whole team, your A-team, which can be family members, healthcare professionals, lawyers, everybody um, is part of that. And I remember when I first had my conversation with you about it uh, in 2012. Uh, so that was a good, I like, practice what, it, what I preach and now that's kind of like paying it forward. Uh, this is some of my work. So thank you so much uh, for that. We're going to hand it over. We're gonna hand it over to Jill right now. Um, I'm gonna, she's gonna kind of be more visual. So if you can put Jill into speaker view. Okay. So I thought about a lot how to do this and how to get people to really feel what it's like to make choices um, when death is, is approaching and we're aware. Um, so I'm gonna try an experiential imagination exercise. Um, so in order to do that, I just want everybody to take a few deep breaths. Just get in a space where you're able to let your head be creative, but also focused. 
and just take those breaths. And I want you to imagine that you've just come to the doctor because something's been a little bit off lately. And you're really nervous about this visit because you're not really sure it could be, it doesn't quite seem right. And you sit down at this visit and you've done your testing and it's time to go over whatever results there are. And you find out that your condition is irreversible, that it has a one-way trajectory, that your prognosis is probably less than a year, and that things are going to be changing quite a bit for you in a very short period of time. I'm sure that this leaves you in a pretty helpless space. A lot of questions might come up. You might be in immediate denial. You might say that there has to be something that we can do. I've heard of some kind of trial or, you know, I'm willing to put up with a lot of pain to live longer. You might not even be able to breathe or to move out of that chair for a number of minutes. If this moment ever comes to you, what I want you to know is that there is help. The medical system might treat you as someone that they cannot treat, and it might feel like a failure, but death comes to us all in whatever way that it comes. And so if you find yourself dying, you're only human, yes, this is depressing and we're angry and this might not be the time or the death that we wanted or expected, but we are here. And you don't have to look to your medical professionals to get help from them because they might not be able to provide all the emotional and guidance support that you need. So if you do find yourself in this position, there is a guide for you. You have the opportunity to go home. You do not have to stay within the walls of a hospital. You do not have to go to a hospice facility. You can simply go home. You can be with your family. You can hire a caregiver. Whatever it is, a doula or an advanced care planner or someone in the death care space can help make this happen for you. I want you to imagine what it would be like to go home and get ready to die. Who would be the people that you would call to be there? What would their role be? Who would be the right person to make you laugh? And then needs to go away because sometimes they're a little inappropriate. Who is going to be in charge of organizing all the food or your call to your estate attorney, which you now really need to make quickly? Who's going to take all the paperwork logistics off of your table? Who's going to be your communication manager and let everybody know that we don't have much time left with you? Who's going to be the person who's going to give you the space to spend with yourself so you can learn how to die? Who don't you want there? Who's not going to agree with your choices? Who's going to make your life more difficult? Maybe this is someone that you need to practice forgiveness with. Now, as you move through your dying process, you have the chance to say goodbye to all of these people. You don't have to wait until you're dead to have a funeral. You can draft letters, you can write an email, you can do a Skype, you can do this in person. But for you as the dying person, if you can, take the time to say goodbye before you leave so there's closure. Now imagine the list of people that you would want to say goodbye to. It might be really short. It might be really long, which means group emails are totally okay. But make sure you, want, you, you get that chance to say goodbye 
because now what's about to happen to you is that you're going to enter your unconscious dying space. Your disease has overwhelmed your body and your body has gone into its instinctual space where it says to you, it's time to die and I will show you how. You will go inward. You will become less aware of the things around you that are bothering you outside. You will go into your own space and the things that will become important to you will be purely atmospheric and energetic. Sounds, light, scent, energy, somebody's presence, even a cat or a dog. All of these things will be a part of your unconscious dying process. And then you will slowly but surely find your way to where you feel comfortable enough and your body, you probably won't even know the moment that you let go and stop breathing because you've fallen so far deep into your subconscious. And so one day we might, we will be facing this. And now you have this small meditation with you that you know you have someone to call to help guide you to create the atmosphere for you both before and after your death. And it is my message to you that it is okay to die. And it's no one's fault if they can't beat a disease or if they're aging. There are people to help you. And every single person that's on this panel today is a death care professional that's offering their services to you. and. I'm very grateful to be able to share this with you guys today. And I hope that that meditation just gave you a little taste of what it's like to walk through someone's shoes that becomes terminal and that you do have good resources. Thank you. That was amazing, Jill. Thank you so, so much. Um, yes, um, a beautiful reflection and an opportunity for us to um, pause um, and be present um, and with those thoughts of mine. If you have any other questions for Jill or any of these topics, once again, we'll have a Q&A area a little bit later. Um, we are going to move on to uh, Sean now um, and talking about disposition and funerals. Hello everyone and thank you again Stephanie for having me. Um, as she mentioned I will be discussing final dispositions um, to help you understand your disposition options. Now disposition refers to the manner in which human remains are finally hand handled or disposed of. Some of final dispositions in America today would be traditional or conventional burial which is either in ground or above ground. Uh, then you have green burial we also have full body burial at sea, fire cremation, pyre cremation, which is done outdoors, or aquamation, also known as alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation. Then you have body donation and a new disposition uh, just recently passed in Washington state would be recompost. So we would recompost your body. Um, some questions you might be asking as you go down the road of what to do with making funeral arrangements would be, do I need a funeral director? Now, in some states, it's legal to have your loved one's body at home after they die. I mean, not in some states, forgive me, in all states. Um, here in California, there's no law requiring a licensed funeral director be involved in making or carrying out your funeral arrangements. Um, who would have the right to make those final disposition arrangements? Well, in California, the right and responsibility goes to the following people in this order. And that would be first you, if you were to write down your instructions before you die, say in an advanced healthcare directive. Um, your healthcare agent, if you named one on your advanced care directive. Uh, your spouse or registered domestic partner. Uh, your adult child or the majority of your adult children if you were to have more than one. 
uh, your parents, your siblings, or depending on who would be left that's surviving you, we'd go in the sequence of order, and the majority of that would have to agree. Um, next question most people would ask would who be who completes a death certificate? In California, the law requires that a funeral director get the medical and health information from the physician or surgeon who last attended the deceased person who is required to also complete these um, medical certifications and return it to that said funeral director within 15 hours of death. Uh, they don't always get it to us that quickly, but we do try to make sure we get it as quickly as possible. You might also ask, must I, must I use a funeral home? In the majority of states, a family or community or religious group can arrange, uh, I'm sorry, can handle a death without hiring a funeral director. And you can do everything on your own, or you can hire a funeral consultant or a death doula like Jill or myself to assist. Um, you can prepare the body for burial. You can acquire the necessary paperwork hold a vigil or a service, and transport the body to a burial site all yourself, given that you have the proper disposition permit. Uh, there are, however, 10 states that do legally require the use of a funeral director, and those states would be Alabama, Connecticut, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, New Jersey, and New York. Um, some may ask, must the body be embalmed? Embalming is almost never required and is an invasive procedure. You can get away with using dry ice or techni ice to re preserve the body for a short period of time. Uh, must one buy a casket is another thing to consider. Um, except for green burial sites, most cemeteries require the use of a casket or other container to enclose and transport the body. However, you can specify an alternative container, a simple wood, fiberboard, or cardboard box, which is much less, much less costly than a casket. Um, you can also build your own casket or buy one from a local retailer online at a fraction of the cost of some funeral homes. And funeral providers are required by law to accept said suitable homemade casket or one from an outside source. And they cannot charge you a fee for doing so or require that you be on site at time of delivery. How do I choose a cemetery? With all death related costs, you would wanna shop around ahead of time if possible. Consider the convenience and location where the cemetery meets your family or religious requires, requirements, if there are any. Uh, visit several cemeteries, ask for a tour of various burial areas, and get a printed itemized price list of all services and merchandise needed. Um, be sure to check for restrictions, including type and size of monuments, whether a vault and markers can be purchased elsewhere, and if the type of grave decorations are allowed. Uh, what types of plots are available, you might ask? Well, most commonly is a single plot or one full-size casket. Um, some cemeteries allow cremation urns to be combined with a casket in one grave. And some smaller plots are sometimes available for child or infant-sized coffins. Um, there are double plots, usually sold to a couple or Two plots can be side by side or one on top of the other where they would be buried on top of each other. And many cemeteries do sell much larger family plots. So if you have a large family and you want to buy everyone together, you can inquire about that as well. You might also ask what other cemetery charges to expect. Um, there is perpetual or endowment care. Now some cemeteries bill a family annually for the upgrade upkeep of the gravesite and cemetery grounds, but more typically there is a one-time maintenance fee. Usually five to ten, five to ten percent of the plot price is added at time of purchase. Um, another cost would be opening closing fees. In addition to the cost of the grave, the cemetery will charge an opening and closing fee at time of burial. 
Uh, this covers the cost to dig the grave and to fill it once the casket has been placed. Uh, you would, if you're pre-purchasing a plot, you want to see if you can prepay for that opening and closing fee at the time so there are no fees at, at time of disposition. Um, the other fee would be markers. Uh, the marker or headstone for a grave can be purchased from the cemetery, a monument company, or even online, depending on the cemetery's restrictions. Some cemeteries make up their own rules. Are there less costly options out there other than traditional burial or, or green burial, or rather burial? Um, and yes, cremation. Uh, more than half of the final arrangements in today involve cremation. The ashes may be scattered, buried, placed in a column burial niche, or kept at home. Um, some cemeteries permit more than one container in a large, in a regular grave, or sell a small, less expensive pot for a special urn section. Another less costly option would be green burial. Um, this is a simple, often low cost choice and is popular with most interested in preserving natural areas or conserving resources. Uh, the body would be buried in a biodegradable coffin or shroud without a vault in a green or natural cemetery. Or there also is the full body sea um, at sea where that's applicable. So if you live on the coast or near the coast, you can do a full body sea burial. A difference between interment and burial. Well, all burials are internments, but all internments are not burials. Interments involve placing a body in one of three places, a grave, an urn, or an above ground burial site. Remember, a burial is a type of internment. Uh, what is traditional burial? The concept of traditional burial has evolved over time. Early in America's history, the family cared for the body after death, wrapped it in a shroud or placed it in a simple wooden coffin and buried it at home or in a nearby cemetery. Today, for most Americans, it is considered traditional to use a funeral home, embalm the body and bury the casket in a vault in a public cemetery. Um, but few of these traditional elements are required by law and families do have a wide range of choices. Um, In-ground burial refers to the ground placement of your loved one's body, generally in a casket. Uh, some cemeteries allow the bodies to be buried without caskets, often to meet requirements of specific religious or cultural groups. Uh, this form of internment may or may not involve embalming the body of the deceased. Uh, monuments or markers available in a variety of materials, styles, and prices typically are placed at the graveside as a memorial. Um, earth burial requires a cemetery plot and is usually includes additional fees for that opening and closing as I mentioned previously. Um, there is also above ground, which is entombment. Entombment requires purchasing a crypt within a mausoleum specifically designed for that purpose. Uh, what is green burial, you might ask? Green burial is defined as a way of caring for the dead with minimal environmental impact that aids in the conservation of natural resources, the reduction of carbon emissions, and the protection of worker health, and the restoration and preservation of habitat. Green burial also emph emphasizes simplicity and environmental sustainability. The body is neither cremated nor prepared with chemicals such as embalming fluids. It is simply placed in a biodegradable container, coffin or shroud, and interred without a concrete burial vault. The grave is allowed to return to nature. Um, my favorite is full body burial at sea. Um, if no casket is used, the EPA recommends wrapping a natural uh, shroud around or a sail cloth around the body and adding additional weight or a steel chain to aid in the rapid sinking. Um, burials at sea of non-cremated human remains must be at least three nautical miles from land in at least 600 depth of water. Uh, cremation is another form of disposition and cremation is the process of reducing the body to bone fragments through the application of intense heat. 
This procedure usually takes from one to three hours and occurs in a special type of furnace known as a cremation chamber or retort. The remains are then processed into a fine, finer substance and placed in a temporary urn. Or before the remains are returned to the family, they're usually transferred into an urn for permanent containment. We have in California, which becomes legal next month in July, alkaline hydrolysis, um, which this process involves using pressure, heat, lye to break down the body into a, its chemical components, resulting in a liquid as well as in an ash that can be returned to loved ones. This process on average yields 20 to 30 percent more remains than a fire cremation. Proponents of this process say it's a more ecologically friendly option than cremation, and I'm one that says that. Then you have body donation. Now, whole body donation or body bequest is the donation of a whole body after death for research and education. They're used for gross anatomy, surgical anatomy, and further medical education. Um, and that's basically all I have. So if you have any questions, then we'll get to those a little later. Thanks again, Stephanie, for bringing me aboard. Yeah, there is so much information when you start. It's not something that, it's not a dinner conversation we usually have, even though we are trying to start talking about our wishes and so on. But when it comes to funerals and disposition, it becomes endless of options that we just, there's so much to discuss. And one of the things that I love that Sean sent me was like, like we're having resources. Sean is like a resource person like I am. So she sends so much information and helpful tips. But one, one was like 82 helpful tips to get started on, you know, your own funeral arrangements. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was just a little too much for me. Um, and we have some that are definitely more uh, leaned in if you're asking the right questions but this was a really great overview in a short period of time of like the, the onion layers of like kind of getting down what what different options are not just doing the traditional way but what else is out there and other people to talk to and communicate and we'll get over we'll talk a little bit later within that the range of values and costs and expectations can change so much. So Sean, thank you so much <laughs> for, for that. Uh, we're gonna turn it over. I just wanna interject really fast. So I'm a life learner and I am so excited to hear from Jill and Sean because these are things that we need to update our advanced directives with. And so I can't wait to meet with you offline so that we can make our advanced directives even more robust. We have like, the dementia provisions, now we have COVID provisions, now I'm gonna have all of this other stuff. I'm so excited, I just couldn't stop. But Yeah, basically. it's very helpful to know what options are out there. So when you're in that pre-planning stage, you have a visual of what could potentially happen. Yeah, and so, Sean actually great. has one that she shared out too that is kind of the larger, and that's kind of where I love the advanced healthcare, end of life planning, it's, it's all one, um, right. you know, as part of it. So thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over to Megan right now to share her story and Bob's story. Hey guys, thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm so excited to be here, and actually I really love sharing this story, and I really love sharing this story, especially after all that information that we just heard because I think, um, well, one of the things Stephanie and I talked about when we were preparing for this, um, this webinar is how often case studies are when things go terribly wrong, right? We, we, we take a look at what happens when things go terribly wrong. And so what I wanna do instead today is sort of flip that over and say, what does it look like when things go terribly right? right um and then i want to show um first what what the last seven weeks of my dad's lo life looked like um for him and for the rest of the family and then i want to backtrack and kind of give you the context of why right what what did it take for us to get to a place where we were able to have such a successful um dying process and finally what i want to do is get behind the red tape as they tell me is my job today and uh, i have some notes on the exact uh, figures and numbers for the exact costs of what we spent to do what we did. Um, 
So hopefully it, it gives some good insight. So um, my dad, really cool guy, retired third grade teacher, uh, sailor, everybody's favorite guy around town. You know, if you've ever been related to a teacher, you know how it is. Everywhere you go, somebody knows your, your parent and um, just a really, really fun person. And um, he moved closer to be near my family. I'm a mom of two young kids. I live up in Ventura, California, and he was about two hours away. So uh, he was a widow of my mother. Um, they had been married for 44 years. And so he decided that he was gonna move closer to be near his kids and grandkids. And about two months after he moved here, um, during which point he went on two international trips, one to Cuba and I think one to Mexico, separate trips. Anyways big traveler, fun guy, um, started experiencing some of those health issues. And we really thought it was going to be COPD. We really thought it was going to be something manageable. And on June 12th of last year, we went in to get a scan and I actually went with him. Um, and, uh, the doctor was wonderful, had some really good bedside manner, manner and was incredibly direct and said, this is bad news. This doesn't look good. And so beginning on June 12th, we had an idea that this was not going to play out the way that one might hope. And by June 25th, uh, my dad had a biopsy. He had had whatever scans and jumped through all the hoops that you do. And the biopsy returned that it was a uh, uh, lung cancer that had spread to a number of places. It would be considered stage four. And um, the doctors who, the oncologist who called for the biopsy actually asked my dad to drive down about 40 minutes to the office to receive the results, which we knew what the results were. There was not a lot of question of what the results were. And they said that they had a policy that they were unable to share those results over the phone. Well, I knew that one of the things my dad hated to do was go to the doctor and we had a really frank conversation he and I and I said does it matter what the results are um, if our goal is to stay out of the doctor's office what are we going to do to achieve that goal and what we were able to do um, based on advice from two of the esteemed colleagues on the phone or on the call here Stephanie and Jill what we were able to do was engage with a hospice in our area and although the doctor had a policy that they were unable to give a diagnosis of this sort over the phone to a patient there wasn't a problem for them to give the diagnosis to a hospice there was no nothing to prevent that and so we were able able to actually get hospice to arrive at our house within the time it would have taken us to pack him up into the car and get him transferred down and up into the elevator into their doctor's office. So we had already, I felt like we skipped a step. And to this day, that's one of my proudest accomplishments of all time. I knew what my dad wanted and didn't want, and I was able to put in front of him the options and it got a little heated on the phone, right? I mean, I was trying to navigate something that Jill mentioned in the in the chat box there is, you gotta know the difference between policy and law. And the people that you're working with do have jobs and part of their job is to follow policy and part of your job as an advocate is to find ways to make that policy work in your favor. And so the picture here on the screen on the left was taken on, I have my dates here, was taken on June 26th. So we got the diagnosis on June 25th, got hospice there that night, got um, the comfort kit, which is all the good pain meds and all the anti-anxiety drugs delivered that night. And I got on Airbnb and reserved a beautiful, absolutely magical rental home about 45 minutes away from where we lived that night. We were there in under 24 hours. I called the hospice to tell them what our plan was, uh, thinking that maybe they would want to hold off on, I don't know, I thought it would be a problem. They were beyond supportive. They asked for the address, asked if we'd like them to front run supplies up there, asked them to send um, pictures of what the place looked like so that if there was an issue and we needed to call them, they were prepared with a site inspection. I never could have imagined that they would not even be supportive and accommodating, but encouraging of that. So we spent three magical days up in Ojai. We drank 
drank through all the good wine that we had at my dad's house. We packed in, um, and this will be a this will be a theme is alcohol consumption, but I don't think that that's required. Um, I think anything that you enjoy as a family, if that's cotton candy, replace what I say about beer and wine with cotton candy. Um, but what we were able to do was start um, what we kind of called the ender bender. And we went on a seven week party. And for seven weeks straight, we ensured that every single day contained a component of celebration because that's what we had bought um, with that time. So immediately upon return from this Ojai trip, I asked my dad very directly. I said, dad, I am your nearest family member, both in proximity and relationship. And I cannot be here to celebrate life and live it with you and also be running point on caregiving and as a mom of a two and a four year old i need to know that you're safe otherwise i can't sleep i'm gonna be just i'm gonna wear myself so thin and we need to look into 24-hour companion care and he really didn't want to do it but because i had come to him in a way that said i need this for me I don't need it for you. I was really frank. He didn't need it yet, but I also knew that we couldn't wait until he did need it. And that's really a theme here is just bringing things into play before it's critical in an emergency allows you to play with the times and become comfortable with it and find the caregiver, right? So my dad ended up being able to make really wonderful relationships with um, the people that ended up being there for him when he was completely unconscious in a bed um, and at that truly end of life stage. You know, it's almost like the nanny, right? You bring a nanny in as a mom, you bring a nanny in when they're little tiny infants and hope that they really, really like them. And you know that by the time they're a toddler, everybody's in love with them. But when they're so fragile and little and they can't tell you anything, you just have this wish that, that it's somebody who you trust. And so being able to go in the opposite direction was really, really amazing. And also, Joe mentioned the opportunity to go home. This is something that we always, always knew. There was never a consideration of where this should happen. It should happen at home. Um, and so taking that question off the table was really great. Um, so um, we did end up using medical aid and dying, which is legal here in California. And when I say we used medical aid and dying, I wanna be clear. I think that anytime you engage in the medical aid and dying process and explore it in any conscious way, you are using medical aid and dying. You do not need to consume the prescribed medication in order to benefit from the choice and the process. And so we ended up, um, receiving, um, well, we, um, I asked my dad whether he would be interested in meeting with a death doula. Jill and I um, were friendly colleagues at that point. Um, we'd worked on a number of uh, projects, but we were we were friendly colleagues and I appreciated and respected her and gave him the option and he was very open to it. Jill came and met with my dad on July 2nd and it was so cool, it just felt like a hangout. My dad was a really cool, fun guy, just like Jill's dad. Um, and I, it, I think there's like a lot of similarities there, but she came and hung out for a while. And then at a certain point, she excused me from the room and she had a conversation with my dad. And it was really special to know that he was getting direct support. I was getting direct support. We had somebody who was just helping us navigate this really confusing time. And, um, that's when the, the medical aid and dying conversation, which I had always known was his choice, that's when it really became a, a true reality. Um, and Jill made the referral that day, actually before she pulled away from the curb, she reached out to Dr. Bob Uslander down in um, Del Mar. And Dr. Bob was able to get the process started. This is one of those things where even when you've had all the conversations and know all the wishes, you really do need that person who's there in the moment and knows who is currently taking patients and what the current process and legality is. We were aware that it had become legal, but we didn't know how it worked. And so Jill really kickstarted that. Um, we handled those important meetings and my dad did go through and receive the prescription um, and then you work with a, a specialized pharmacy and because of the way his disease progressed, by the time um, the prescription was available and um, there's a certain number of waiting period, um, 
I knew that he was far from being able to consume the liquid in the same way, but I still have these professionals on my team. I have this pharmacist and the doctor and the nurse um, in Dr. Bob's um, office, integrated medical care. And I, I had these people that were advising me. And so my pharmacist um, kept the package fully ready to go, fully um, filled, the, the drugs were filled. I did not get charged, but it was ready to be couriered to our house at a moment's notice. And that was exactly the sense of security that my dad needed in order to reach. So you see here on the left, he's got his full oxygen tank. He's on morphine and Ativan on June 26th. And the picture on the right was taken on August 2nd. And that was really his it was his dinner party and it was a very hand select group of people. There were probably six to 10 times as many people who wished they could have been there. And part of what I offered was the ability to keep it small so that it could be exactly what he envisioned was, which was a bright, lively party that was also going to be the last time he saw a lot of the really special people in his life. And so, um, that took place on August 2nd and almost immediately thereafter, um, family stayed in town um, and the people that weren't invited to the party were invited to stop by for like a reception the next day. It was pretty special. He really held a firm boundary there and I appreciated it. Although I was the one that had to enforce it and that was incredibly difficult. It also felt like a real gift um, that we were able to maintain that atmosphere. Um, and so, uh, Shortly after um, this party, we had family in town for about the next 48 hours. And then he went into a very natural week long demise and he died on August 11th. Um, so seven days after family left, he departed. And it just, it couldn't have gone better. And truly the reason behind this is because my dad had had some really terrible experiences leading up to it. Um, and I, I sort of saw him as, the, the buck stops here guy, right? He, he had helped not only my mom go through some really traumatic cancer treatments uh, in 2017, he had also um, helped close down the estate of both of his parents as well as my mom's mom. So he had handled three death dying and estate closing processes as sort of the key um, figure in the family and he had also really been there front and center to see what my mom had been through and as I mentioned earlier my mom died while I was on maternity leave so I, I was pregnant during her cancer she really did run a battle she ran a cancer battle and Bob didn't Bob just lived he, he lived with cancer the way some people live with you know all kinds of different conditions he just lived until he stopped. Um, I think that it's really important that my dad never held back about what a painful experience and how unnecessary it was to be faced with the sort of unanswered questions in previous instances. I know that, you know, he wrote, he was a writer um, and he wrote some stuff that he never was shared during his lifetime, but that was shared with me. And he talked very, very frankly about the experience of being the youngest son of four boys and having to not only navigate his parents deaths but see how his three older brothers were navigating it and um, he did not have very kind words for those things so I think preventing that from uh, befalling my sister and I and that's my sister on the left there in the black shirt and one thing I want to point out about this picture, which I just really love, is that we we had this dinner party. Um, we had it catered. You can see he was, I called him Deathzilla because um, he was, he, we had a lot of good jokes, but he really went to town on this this backyard party that I put more effort into than I did my own wedding. Um, but it, as we were having the photo taken by the caterer, a giant rat ran along the back fence and it was so startling everybody screamed and then everybody started laughing and so that's the picture that you see right here and we all um, were joking later about whether that was you know his favorite hilarious aunt who always liked to play tricks or his dad who was a real joker um, so it was a real fun way to um, 
be able to joke around and you know it's that black humor but it was really accepting of what was happening um we had two private musicians that attended it a, a steel drummer and an electric guitarist um you try to find those on short notice when you're thinking at any moment that you might need to shift this whole thing a week forward if his physical condition starts to um take a break but one of the other things that's really important is my dad had a bad experience with the deaths that he had run point on. And I didn't realize this until after he had died is that he wanted to make sure that planning and facing this wasn't a painful process for us. And so really what he did is he engaged my sister and I in the planning process for his death immediately upon my mom's death. And one of the most um, relevant moments was when he took us out, we had a champagne toast before we went to meet with the trust attorney because he said, after I die, this is one of the first people that you're, you guys are gonna have to talk to. So I wanna make sure that you, uh, before you meet him, you get loosened up and you guys like each other or something like that. Um, and I think that being able to see not only the benefits of a plan, but the way a plan itself doesn't have to be a painful process. It can be something that allows you to live more vibrantly because you have faced it head on. Um, and, oh, can I run through costs? I know I'm over time, Steph. I'm so sorry. You're on mute. I think that might be something that we can share afterwards because cool. we have less time than we thought. So, but thank you. Thank you. Um, I, but I think those, those breakdowns are, because I know there's a lot of uh, interest in breakdowns uh, as well, but let's get a, I want to make sure I get a question for the, all the panelists. Um, so, but thank you. I think what's great of personal stories is what, what really shows up. What are the moments that shows up that's important um, of, of really knowing somebody, the drive to the doctor's office, um, what, you know, what beverage of choice do you somebody enjoy? Um, so really getting to know somebody and what are the highlights? So thank you, Megan, for, for sharing your, your dad, Bob's story um, uh, and the empowerment piece, I think kind of um, really shows up in terms of having those conversations and really being present. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go back. We have a lot of questions. So I thank you all for participating in some of the questions. I have one for you, uh, Rebecca. It's if you have a trust from the get go, do you still need a will? So I think there's some questions about the difference between a will and a trust or something like that. So what are your thoughts on that? That was from Monique. Uh, so yes, uh, a trust and a will do the same thing. They say who gets your stuff when you die, but either you're following the trust and hopefully avoiding probate or you're following the will and going through probate. So once you get a trust, you need a special kind of trust called a pour over will. And it acts as a safety net for the $166,250 that would trigger probate. It acts as a safety net to capture those assets you do not retitle into the name of the trust. And then thereby avoiding um, us having to, to go to court. So it's really important in, in mentioning this, that you fund your trust. A lot of people will, um, a lot of attorneys will just hand the trust document and the estate planning documents to the client and then say, oh, remember you have to fund it. And the client doesn't really know what they're talking about. And they're just like, phew, I got my documents, I'm done. But really until you fund it, until you retitle the assets out of your name into the trust name or update beneficiary designations, you are not done with your estate planning process. Otherwise we're ending up in court and it could sort of defeat the purpose of, of having the trust in the first place. Great. For Sean, we have a question um, about donating your body to science or cadaver st studies. What does that look like in that process that you can give us a little bit of, um, if that's a, a choice people want to make, what's the process with the body donation and what can you can or can't do in terms of funeral arrangement with that? Uh, well, if you donate your whole body, then there wouldn't be any funeral arrangement after you know, you wouldn't need to worry about the disposition. Some um, body donation programs will uh, either, like science care, they will do what they need with the remains and then maybe return a portion of remains to the family. Uh, whereas say like UC system, they won't return the remains to the family. They will cremate and scatter at sea unwitnessed. Um, they do have an annual ceremony for everyone to gather. 
Um, if you're interested in body donation, I would research the various institutions that accept bodies to find out what it is they would be doing with the body and what you feel comfortable with, with what they're doing and whether or not they would return any portion of the remains to you or not, if that's something you're interested in. Now, if you donate your body to science, there's no reason why you can't have a celebration of life. Um, you don't need the body or the remains to be present for that type of service uh, because in, in reality, you're celebrating that person's life, regardless if they're present or not. You could have photos and things to that nature. Um, if you are wanting to donate organs, uh, say if you're an uh, organ donor, like on your driver's license, um, that would fall under if you were to um, have like a situation where you were in say a car accident and now you're brain dead, but your body's still functioning, then they can harvest the organs and then you can still have a, a ceremony or a final disposition of burial or cremation with that loved one. Um, then there's also the option for one legacy, which they would come in and remove uh, cornea, uh, skin or long bones. Uh, and they use that for medical research or repurposing that in other living beings um, to help them. So there's a few different options. If you want any more detail, then feel free to contact me and I can go into specifics. Thank you. This is back to Rebecca for a second, but I know this is something that's important to all of us on the call regarding advanced healthcare directives. Um, are they more about a guidance or are they legally binding? What do you feel like some different... Rebecca, I can throw it to you, but a lot of people, I know Jill shaking her head, that can answer that as well. How do we look at advanced healthcare directives as legally binding and writing, but also the conversations? Can you talk a little bit about that, Rebecca? So, it's, so in terms of the conversations, um, there, there's more to have in the conversations that go into a traditional advanced directive. Um, if you're working, I mean, just honestly, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of advanced directives and they're all pretty awful. Uh, we've never seen one where we go, oh my God, this is great, ever not once. So, so the majority of the legal documents are not written for a lot of the specific, or most of these specifics that we've talked about today, but it's not to say it can't be, like I'm super excited we get to update ours to include all kinds of new stuff yeah. um, that I think is important. So. You have to have the legal documentation so that the right person is in charge and you have to have sort of the end of life medical stuff written down um, so that you're giving those guidelines to your agent. But in terms of all the other stuff, especially after you're gone, um, you know, these are conversations to have with your agent. This is the person who legally has the authority to, to do all this. And you want to write down as much as you possibly can. I have one client where it's like she hired someone in advance to plan her funeral. Um, and so she's got, I think it's nine pages, single spaced of instructions. Yeah. So, yeah. I, mean, I feel like we spend a lot of time on the advanced healthcare directive, the plan, the document, legal document, which is limited and then larger conversations. I know that's what a lot of the work um, all of us death care professionals do is is really about those larger conversations and there's a lot of great tools and resources that we have um but and that's we also have the death deck which is a, a conversation starter um card a deck of cards that we use um i have two back-to-back -back questions i'm gonna ask jill this um and then also open it up to other the first one is there's been questions about death doula training and certification what does that look like and the next step is about medical aid and dying and where um, there, where that's um, available states, where that's uh, in, endorsed, um, authorized or not. So those are kind of two questions. And medical aid in dying, which is a, a topic we could also do on our own. Um, I know a few of us on the call have all been uh, involved with that personally, professionally. Um, and I know that Catlin just had a converse, had a talk, a uh, presentation on that as well. But that's something we can go into a little bit more deeper another time. Uh, but go ahead, Jill, about the doula training and just medical aid and dying and access. Well, I would say we also have that YouTube video available for people who want to. Oh, yeah, watch yeah, yeah. This is true. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so as far as, as doula training goes, just take a moment and pause and ask yourself, like, what attracts me to being a quote-unquote death doula? 
what I want you to know about being a death doula is that it's a relatively new like term that's being adopted and utilized. Um, there are many, <laughs> there are many training programs available. And I noticed that someone put in the chat Anelda. What I'm going to tell you about some of these trainings that are available is that in 2018, less than 1% of funeral directors in the United States had ever heard of a death doula. However, the death doula training institution, Anelda in particular, was making over $250,000 a year on pumping out trainings. So if you're gonna do a death doula training, you need to have a plan and you need to be able to get a business up and running and you need to be able to practice and practice and practice your skills on your own, be very self-motivated. Um, and also, I would say the content out of a lot of these death doula trainings is repeated. And there are a lot of people out there who took a training and built a training. But there's also a lot of people out there who have been doing this work for 20 years, came from the AIDS crisis, can offer you bedside you know, assistance you know, of what it's like to really be there with the dying. So if you're thinking about doing death doula training, think, A, do I even wanna be a death doula? Because you can do anything you want in death care. This space is wide open for you right now. Look at this panel, like it's wide open, go for it. Um, and B, if you really do want to be a death doula, um, get a plan because you're going to need to start a small business to function. I am a professional doula. I do run my small business. I do make my full-time income doing this business. Like Sean, like we freaking hustle. And so if it's, this is something you want to invest in, because it will be expensive, make sure you do it with intention. Thanks so much. And with medical aid and thank you so much for about medical aid and dying. Do you want to kind of talk about the access and authorization of that a little bit? Okay, so I'll give a quick, quick, quick. Um, so what is it? Nine or 10? I think we're working on our 10th state. Okay, so 10. Okay, so 10 states have the law in place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you as an individual have access in those states. Because in order for you to access the law, you have to have two doctors willing to sign off, and it's their choice. You have to have a pharmacy that's willing to compound a lethal medication, and you have to have support, you know, to do this all together. Um, so if you are looking into medical aid and dying, resources would be compassion and choices, um, that's a, that's a nationwide resource that I think is really trustworthy. Um, and you can check out Compassion and Choices for, for more info there. If you're in the state of Oregon, there's End of Life Choices Oregon. And if you're in the state of California, there's End of Life Choices California as well. But just contact us more and know that even if it's legal in the state, it's going to take a ton of advocacy to get to where you want. Um, so that's that's a whole nother conversation yeah. we'll definitely provide some more um and i thank all of you for your feedback in the chat box you guys are all wonderful resources as well i know there's some information about the youtube prepare your care uh, so appreciate all the wonderful feedback and we'll go through the chat box and make sure when you get the information from catlin afterwards that we have resources that you're really looking for um, I guess just to kind of wrap up, we have a couple of minutes uh, left, but I wanted to let me open this up for a second. Um, I want to go around really quickly and um, I want to go around really quickly and say, what does legacy mean to our panelists? That's one thing. And I want to start with Rebecca and we can go around again. Uh, what does legacy mean to you? I know there's more of a technical, I was looking up like, what's the technical financial legacy word? But really, I think each one of us in terms of our own purpose or legacy for us or for our work or for the families we work with, it's a little differently. So I, um, I wanted to ask um, Rebecca if she wants to go around and answer that question right now. And then just a couple words, one or two words, and then we'll go around again. I had to find my thing to unmute. Yeah. Um, so I think it's leaving family cared for financially if you can, but more importantly, in emotional harmony. Thank you. 
Jill, what is what does legacy mean uh, to you? To me, legacy is the life that I'm living right now. You know, live an authentic life for better or worse, and according to what makes me happy as much as I can. Great, Sean. Uh, legacy for me in sitting with those that are dying, um, which has led me to come to this conclusion, is is your story and what you're leaving behind um, for um, future generations to remember you by, you know? Um, so that's, that's where I would come from. Great. Megan? Um, for me, legacy are the memories that you keep. And I think a lot about the beautiful memories I was able to make with my dad as he was dying and how who he was carried right through all the way to the end and the memories that my kids got to make in those moments. That really feels like a legacy right there. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all, as you can see, I show, we showed the A team earlier. This one is blank. I'm so glad that our A team we were able to share with all of you because there are a lot of people that have specialties and different experience in different areas. I want you to think about who is part of your A team from where you sit right now and that we are all an extension of you as well um, in terms of these different areas. This is just a, a beginning conversation of all the different aspects of um, death care planning and the life care planning. I thank you all for being here. Um, Catlin will be sending you a follow-up evaluation for CEU requirements um, and other resources. Is there, is there anything else, Catlin, that you'd like to share? I'm just noting here that it looks like there is interest in having part two of something like this, so we should talk about that. I would not say no to that. As I mentioned earlier, I do want to well, keep this open. It was a lot. We were, we, were, we were pushing it for this time, but I just knew I wanted to have you feel that flow of conversation um, that was so necessary. Um, right. And well, a lot of people are, it looks like a few people at least are asking for it. And somebody just said, this has been the quickest 90 minutes ever. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree with that. So we should talk about that. This is a really exceptional panel. Thank you so much. Hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day and, and um, grateful that you were um, taking this time with us. Be well. Thank you. Yeah.